Well, hi everyone. Thank you, Dr. Shannon. Thank you, Dr. Paley for joining us in this webinar on the SLIM, its indications and um, demonstration of some cases. Uh, I'm not gonna take up any time. I'm sure there's a lot of very interesting content. So I'll let you guys take the floor. It'll be broken up into two presentations. Okay, so um, I'm going to lead off. I'm Dr. Dror Paley, and uh, Dr. Claire Shannon is going to follow with another presentation after mine, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And uh, um, oh, Fatty, you have to enable sharing the screen from your end as the host. Very good. Okay, so I'm gonna speak more about the techniques and uh, Dr. Shannon's gonna speak more about the indications. Uh, so SLIM, the acronym is for Simple in uh, Locking Intermedullary. Uh, so it's the SLIM system. And uh, I think Pega gets big points for the most innovative names of any company. Um, and um, it's, it's intended use is basically, basically it's intended use is everywhere you used to use a rush rod or flexible intermedullary nail. Um, so we use it, I don't do so much fractures. We do the occasional fractures, mostly lengthening cases that have broken. Uh, but uh, we use it a lot as a prophylactic rod to prevent fractures. So it's a, a great device for that purpose, but it's also a great device for fractures of really any of the long bones, femur, tibia, fibula, humerus, ulna, radius, and so on. Um, so um, why do we need another IM rod? Well, um, you know, I, I um, used to use a lot of rush rods. In fact, I've been using rush rods for 30 plus years in my career. And, and for the exact same indications. In fact, I was never a big flexible nail user, so I'm sure that's heresy. I, I would take this kind of nail any day over a flexible nail. And why? Because of this. I hate the ends of the flexible nail. I didn't particularly like the ends of the rush rod. At least they were round and you could kind of bang them in and they usually weren't that prominent. But um, the beauty of this nail is, you know, uh, we'll see, is it screws into the bone, much like a, you know, everyone else is more familiar with the fascia duval system. Now, with rush rods, what I really liked, however, is the end. And the end of the nail in the rush rod uh, is beveled at about 45 degrees. It's a sharp end, and it therefore it's very directional, and you can get it by using that slope, you can get it to bounce off of cortices, to go up one way or the other by turning the rod and using that kind of bevel to, to direct you. Uh, furthermore, you can bend the nail, and that's the other advantage. Why can you bend it? Because it's not titanium. So I hate titanium nails because they, are, they don't bend that easily. I mean, they, they don't, you can't make acute bends as easily in the titanium nails. You can do it very nicely in the stainless steel nails. So this was intentionally made as a stainless steel nail. And honestly, it was just made as a modern version of the rush rod. Um, I think the rush rod may be the oldest uh, still in use orthopedic implant. So it really is just an extension of a previous concept that has proven itself over decades. And, from last century to this century. Um, so uh, the, the device comes from two millimeters all the way to 6.4. I think it goes two, 2.4, 3.2, 4.0, 4.8, 5.6, 5 and 6.4. Um, so very odd numbers. Don't ask me where they come from, but they, it actually corresponds a lot to the uh, rush rods, which were more in inches than in uh, millimeters. Um, a lot of these sizes, I think, correspond to the Fessier Duval sizes, so that um, 
you know, we can use the same cannulated reamers. Pega makes definitely the longest, um, you know, uh, solid cannulated reamers of various sizes. Now the cannulated reamers start at 3.2. There is no cannulated reamer for the 2.0 or the 2.4. There um, you're using a solid wire or drill bit. Um, <clears throat> the threaded head design at the end, like you see here in this, this uh, the eye of the slim is what the nail looks like, um, is a little different than the uh, Fascia Duval in that it is, these are sharper threads and it is conical. The reason it's conical, it's designed that even if you can't screw it into a bone, if you bang on it, it'll actually impact itself into the bone. So it works very nicely that way. Uh, it's low profile head, avoids proud uh, placement and because the ends are, are sharp. It's not, these are not blunt uh, threads like the Fassier Duval, these are sharper threads. Um, <clears throat> we'll talk about locking in a bit, um, and it's got its own instrumentation, which is rather nice. Uh, so the, the nail design, as we talked about, has this conical shaped head with a hole in it, uh, which allows for locking with uh, basically smooth pins, K-wires, Steinman pins. The hole varies according to the diameter of the nail, so it gets bigger. With, with bigger diameter. Um, and then of course it has the beveled end that you're not looking at it in the correct direction to see the bevel. And then about two centimeters away from the end, there's another locking hole. That is only from 4.8 up. There's no locking hole on the 4.0 or the 3.2. I'd actually like to see the company make locking holes. And the reason is there's really no danger a breakage at this end. There's just not enough lever arm to allow that to break. So I, I think it would be a good idea to actually cannulate those smaller nails as well. Um, the um, various lengths, and we'll talk about this because this is going to change, but currently, um, depending on the diameter, the lengths range from 80 millimeters long to 400 millimeters. Uh, for inventory control, we're going to show you something that's coming, but is just on the verge of being brought out, which is a special cutter, in which case you could cut to uh, the size you want. Um, another feature that uh, is not yet out, it's designed that it's in the process of FDA approval, is this bullet. And this bullet is basically a way to lock a nail that doesn't have a hole in it. So um, uh, it can lock actually um, various sizes, but um, it, it can lock even the very small nails. And the, the idea of the bullet, and I'll show you how it's meant to be done. So um, what you would do, okay, is you'd place a K wire, um, uh, you'd, you'd, put your, you'd put your nail down, you'd place a K-wire that would hit the nail, you'd back out the nail, cannula the drill over the K-wire, and then put the bullet in. So um, it, it is a, and then the bullet has a set screw that locks from the outside around the nail. All right, um, how do you do this technique? It's pretty straightforward. Um, so I start, I actually don't follow these exact steps. I, I use a wire, so there's a different diameter wires for the cannulated drills. Currently for the 3.2 and the 4.0, you need a, a 1.6 wire that comes in the set. And for the uh, larger sizes from 4.8 on, you can use the two millimeter K wire that comes in the set. Um, sometimes I use um, actually Elizaroff wires instead of the slim wires. And the reason is that they're, they have a bayonet shape and uh, I think the company is gonna come out with a bayonet shape. Bayonet wires are directional because again, they're beveled as opposed to diamond tip wires, which is what comes in the set. So we put the wire in, get the wire, snake it down the bone to the other end and then use the appropriate cannula to drill over top of it and then uh, take all that out and put the slim rod down. So I'm not, 
not going to go in the starting points. I mean, everyone here, I think, knows where the normal starting points are for places. And, you know, and I do sometimes go piriformis. These are small diameter nails. You're not going to get AVN with these nails. There's not reaming, none of that. I think for FDA purposes, they've got it in the trochanter. I very frequently go on the piriformis. Not a big deal in children. Never had a problem with that with, you know, with a 3.2 or 4.0 uh, entry. Um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, um, so th the introducing uh, instrument is this, uh, uh, this special handle, which uh, captures the head of the nail. Uh, you, you turn this by hand, and then you put on this uh, pink handle over top of it that screws onto this instrument. It, it's actually a nice introducer um, and gives you good capture and the ability to put it in and pull it out. Removal can be challenging, I will tell you that, because for removal, you need to get this instrument screwed in, and as you know, doesn't always capture so easily. Um, in many cases, I've just put a similar size Allen wrench in and unscrewed it and then grabbed it with a needle driver and pulled it out if I can't get this instrument to screw in for removal. For introduction, it's actually phenomenal, really good. Um, so once you've got your hole, you put your nail in. As I say, we don't use it a lot for fractures, uh, but I think it's a great device for fractures. Um, it will give you the opportunity to lock at either end and there's nothing sticking out. I think that's the best part is that there's nothing sticking out um, that's gonna irritate the patient's uh, skin or muscles and so on. Um, there is an end cap. Uh, I have never used it and I've put in more than 500 slims. So that probably tells you how valuable and useful the end cap is. Uh, but it must be a reason they made an end cap to plug the hole. Uh, I think it prevents bone from growing in there. Again, not a big deal. If you want, you can use an end cap. Um, I think this is the best part, of course, is these Pega cantilated drills. It's the longest cantilated drills available, okay? Um, they, th the cantilated ones start at 3.2, 4, 4.8, 4, 4 5.6, 6.4. Uh, this, as you notice, is a solid drill for the 2.6. And um, then for the 2.0, um, you can start with a 2.0 guide wire, you know, and, and you've got a drill. So it does go down to the, the really small sizes. Um, the only issue I've had with the really small sizes, sometimes the bones so small, they, they did not reduce the size of the head attached to the 2.0, and I hope that they're gonna do that. So for the 2.0 and 2.6, if I can give a message to the company, reduce the, the size of the head, because it, it, some of the bones you're putting it in are too narrow to even accept the size of the head, but they're perfect for the, you know, for obviously the diameter of the nail. Um, that's the rest of the instruments. These two wrenches are used to actually grab onto the small wrench, turns this knob if you can't turn it by hand. Um, the bigger wrench turns this thing if you can't turn that by hand. Um, and that is the small wrench with the big wrench. Okay, that is for the bullet and the capture. Um, and that's pretty much it. There is, this is for the extractor, okay or insertion. I use a mallet, I don't use this thing. But I do use it for the removal. The removal, I think it's very useful. Um, this is a new thing, the ICON, Intraoperative Cutting of Nails. It, uh, is, it's just coming out now. We haven't even removed this. We've never used this. Uh, the idea is to cut the bevel so, and reduce inventory. So if you don't want to have 5 million nail sizes, which at our institution, we do this so often, I don't think a week goes by that we don't insert, you know, a handful of these nails. So, um, you know, having all the different sizes not an issue, but, you know, if you can't afford, if you can't have all that inventory, having this and then one set of inventory of diameters will allows you to shorten um, a stock nail 
to any length you want. And, you know, so you've got this base with this cutting jig, the nail goes in here and then cuts at an angle. And so you have these stock pieces and you're gonna cut them at whatever length you want at an angle or bl blanks, I guess they call it. All right, um, so this nail was developed in collaboration with Dr. Daniel Green, Kishore Malpuri and myself. Uh, together with uh, Fadi and Ariel from uh, uh, from Pega Medical, um, it was launched in 2015, and it is available worldwide. It's actually um, gotten a lot of use uh, in a very short time. Uh, I can tell you that at our place, uh, all our docs are using it, um, our adult and our pediatric guys, because it's just so useful and. Claire is going to show you why it's useful. So I'm not gonna show you any indications. I'm gonna pass the mic on to Claire. Just as an aside, I've had even adult tumor colleagues with, you know, very, so adult patients with big long bones, but who had anatomy that wouldn't compensate or wouldn't accommodate typical adult implants. And they've used these and loved them as well. So Claire, you want to start your slides? Uh, oh, I'll, I'll stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah. Claire. Okay. So, um, Dr. Claire Shannon, Dr. Paley's, I think, still newest partner. I don't think anybody's usurped that position from me yet. Um, so I was at Johns Hopkins prior to moving to the Paley Institute, and I've been there since about September. So as Dr. Paley said, we do lots and lots of slim rods. So we'll go through some indications that we use. Um, our practice is sometimes a little different than typical animals. So we don't have a lot of straightforward pediatric fracture cases, but we certainly found a few. Um, so one of the most common things in I put this one up front, well, not most common, but one of the things we use commonly, and I put this one up front because I have just submitted this um, data for a whole bunch of presentations, um, but we are doing something now called extramedullary implantable limb lengthening um, in the style of lengthening over a nail, as has been done for many years, um, but we are taking children who are theoretically too small to have an intramedullary lengthening device and placing that on the outside of the bone. Um, so just to start, this is a four-year-old with left congenital femoral deficiency in fibrial hemimelia. Um, they have undergone a prior super ankle and a lengthening with an external fixator of the tibia of five centimeters. So the current femoral discrepancy is seven centimeters, but as you can see, the diameter of that bone is quite small. And in a four-year-old, there are still, you know, concerns about, um, a large diameter hole in the apophysis, but more so just getting a nail inside that bone is not going to be feasible. Click on your slide. Yeah, I got it. Um, so our solution is that we are placing the lengthening nail on the outside, but in order to avoid deviations of the mechanical axis, we can we place a slim rod inside the bone and perform lengthening over a nail. And so far, and I think we're up to just over 20 cases, we've had no um, deviations of any axes in any direction as we've been lengthening other than intentional ones. As you can see, we add an eight plate there. And this is a trochanteric start femoral nail here. Um, and then you can see as this bone lengthened, the regenerate forming around that and this was then the nail was removed and I believe this was removed approximately six weeks after the end of lengthening because we're seeing incredibly rapid consolidation uh, given that the slim rod intramedullary the drill the reamer is so small we're really not damaging any of the blood supply to the bone. Um, we do a fair number of non-union repairs in all shapes and forms so this happened to be a nine-year-old boy with multiple hereditary exostosis uh, who had had a prior attempt at ulnar lengthening um, and developed a non-union and had subsequently gone on to um, 
dislocate his radial head and developed a pretty significant flexion contracture of about 45 degrees. So we underwent fixation of this with acute shortening of the ulna, uh, as well as deformity, or, or sorry, rotational correction. Um, and an ulnar slim rod allowed us to stabilize that shortening, correct the rotation, and then an additional small plate uh, was used for uh, rotational control. But the other benefit of uh, having this fixation is that we've got excellent stability, which allows him to get started on immediate range of motion physical therapy so that we can uh, continue to work on increasing his elbow range of motion and avoid any further stiffness. And you can see what a nice implant this is in the nice straight ulna. Um, so on the similar line for small bone deformities, so this is another young man with multiple hereditary exostosis uh, who has been developing some left forearm ulnar bowing, which as you can see is starting to subluxate his radial head. Um, on his clinical exam, he was beginning to have a significant decrease in his rotational range of motion. And so at our institution, we are pretty aggressive about treating these in order to preserve the elbow. Um, and so he underwent a left opening wedge ulnar osteotomy. So you can appreciate in similar fashion uh, the placement of the ulnar slim rod. And this requires a single cut. And as you place the straight slim rod, it helps to straighten out the ulna, which then allows for an opening wedge, which can then be additionally fixed for rotational control with a small plate. Again, the incredible advantage of this is that it allows us to really begin immediate range of motion for these patients, um, which helps to get them back up and running sooner. Um, it's also a very strong fixation. The uh, size of that rod in comparison to that bone is so large that uh, we don't worry about fractures and we can start their activities pretty quickly. Um, we do a lot of lengthening with external fixation still, although less and less. Um, and so one of the most common indications for us is protection of regenerate bone. So this is a tibial example, which is less common. Um, femurs uni almost universally get rotted when the fixers comes off, and I believe I have an example of that coming up. But in this particular case um, with this tibia, you can see even after three and a half months of consolidation, you can still appreciate that the regenerate is quite thin on this tibia. And so due to this narrowing, we wanted to add a little bit of uh, protection to avoid fracture. So at the time of frame removal, we placed a, an intramedullary uh, anagrade tibial nail um, in order to protect the bone, but also with reaming um, that will help stimulate a little bit of hypertrophy. So he also additionally had a, a cast that he was allowed to weight bear in. Um, and we can see pretty quickly how that bone even in a short time, this is one month later, and you can already appreciate the increased diameter of that narrow area of the tibia. Um, and he's had no fracture and has maintained his alignment. Um, so as I mentioned, femoral fixator removals, um, we all know from some prior uh, published data by some of our esteemed colleagues that uh, femoral fracture rate after lengthening can be upwards of 30%. So we really want to make sure we protect these kids after all the hard work they and we have been through. So this is a five-year-old girl uh, with CFD who had previously had a super hip, and this is her first lengthening, uh, five centimeters with a drive rail monolateral rail device. And you can appreciate her nice regenerate there. So at the time of this fixator removal, a slim rod was then placed, again, in an integrated fashion to protect that regenerate. Um, just like in all the other indications, this protection of this bone allows for um, pretty immediate weight bearing and lets us uh, really get started on range of motion. In some cases where sometimes we've got a little bit of joint stiffness, um, we will occasionally cross the physis distally um, in order to protect the physis so that we aren't getting, um, so that we're not at risk of any fracture when we're working on flexion uh, activities in physical therapy. One of the advantages of the slim rod is that beveled tip. Um, as the patient grows off of the end of that rod, as their distal physis grows away from it, that hole gradually fills in behind it. And so we have not really had, I don't think we've had any cases, especially recently, 
uh, of growth arrest because of that sort of slow, gradual pull away. Um, some more complex cases, these slim rods come in very handy. So we do a very large amount of congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia at our institution. Um, this young man at seven had had multiple surgical attempts um, with no success. And as you can see, he's got a very large tibial deformity with multiple pseudoarthrosis sites uh, and a pretty significant knee flexion contracture. So typically we would fix these with an FD rod. However, um, in this particular young man's case, in order to span both of these deformities, um, in order to simplify some of the headaches for us, we felt that a slim rod, uh, also the, uh, would, well, we felt that placing a slim rod would uh, increase our ability to uh, fix this deformity, but also the solid nature of the slim rod as opposed to, um, the cannulated, even though you're putting the male portion in, but you do still have some area um, that isn't fully solid, that the slim rod would give us a little bit of improved strength. Um, so this allowed us to really capture this nicely and you can appreciate where we started and where we ended up and how significant a repair this is for this kid. So we find a way to use slim rods for all kinds of things and sometimes multiple times in the same patient. So this young man uh, has got bilateral tibial hemimelia and his left knee uh, required a fusion. And so this ultimately was done by placing a slim rod across the, uh, across the knee after an osteotomy had been performed uh, with the addition of a temporary plate. Uh, his right ankle, uh, was then fused later on with a retrograde slim, and I'll show that in the next set of slides. You can also appreciate, I didn't mention here, but he also had an uh, extra medullary tibial lengthening where we also lengthened over the nail using a retrograde slim. So this is then his left ankle. So you can see over here, he had had a prior uh, epiphysidesis of the fibula. And so he had a revision ankle fusion over here where we were actually able to place rods through the hind foot into both the fibula and the tibia for additional stability, uh, as well as plate fixation. And so this child now has a sum total of four slim rods in his two lower extremities uh, and is doing great. So again, going retrograde in the foot, this is a nice example where you can see that uh, head is able to be screwed right up into the bone so that there's no prominence which allows this patient to weight bear on this uh, quite comfortably. Um, humeral slim rods, because we got to cover every bone in the body. So this is a young lady who, with achondroplasia who had a 10 centimeter humeral lengthening. And again, after about three months of consolidation, still had uh, some thin areas of regenerate. And so uh, the decision was made to place slim rods after the frames were removed um, in order to help protect that. And you can see these x-rays were done, I believe about three months later. Um, and you can see the uh, quite remarkable hypertrophy of the bone in the meantime, with beautiful straight alignment that was maintained. And this is, I believe a year and a half out. And again, she's essentially reconstituted the full caliber of her humeri, again, with no alteration in her uh, uh, mechanical axis. So fracture fixation, uh, like we said, we don't get your typical pediatric fractures, but we do see them. Um, and this uh, four-year-old boy had been treated for a posterior medial bow uh, and had had a, an external fixator for deformity correction and a five centimeter lengthening. Uh, his frame was removed two months uh, prior to him showing up with uh, this diaphyseal tibial fracture uh, in the area of the regenerate. And unfortunately, as you can see, he's developed some varus deformity here. Um, so this was actually taken to the operating room yesterday. So these are fresh off the presses. Uh, and you can see that we were able to correct the deformity and nicely stabilize the bone with this slim rod. Um, and so he is now much happier and much more comfortable and will go on to heal this quite nicely. Um, I know also talking to Fadi in advance of this, there were some questions about locking of slim rods and FD rods. And so I've got a couple slides on that. So we'll talk about that quickly. Um, so this is an example of a femoral slim rod 
uh, interlocking. So this uh, seven-year-old boy had had lengthening of uh, bilateral femurs for congenital femoral deficiency. You can see in the uh, long leg x-ray here that he had already had the left side removed with a slim rod placed and a screw left in the femoral neck to protect it. On the other side, he uh, completed his lengthening to equalize his leg lengths and a slim rod was placed. And this is an example here where you can see the rod was placed intentionally across the physis um, to protect it during uh, knee flexion in physical therapy. Unfortunately, uh, this patient had a small amount of collapse of the bone through one of the proximal pin sites here, and that rod ended up protruding into the joint. Um, we had some issues with not uh, listening to all of the instructions here too. So um, we did take him back to shorten it, and at the time when we shortened it, we chose to interlock this just proximal to the physis in order to provide some rafting to help prevent uh, further shortening. So on this lateral view here, you can see um, the uh, interlocking wire going through that distal hole. And you can see here, we've curled the ends. Um, and on numerous views, we ensured that this uh, end of the wire was not capturing his physis on this side. Um, and that helps to hold that in place. And then another example of interlocking, just to because I had a better fluoro picture of this one, um, in similar fashion, this is not a slim rod. This is a Fassier Duval rod. However, it, we do this the exact same way. So this was a child who was undergoing a cross-union procedure for congenital pseudoarthrosis of the tibia. And as you can see, what we do is use a lateral view to obtain a perfect circle of that distal hole and then using the appropriate size interlocking wire, so in this case it was a 1.5, you can line it up just as you would in any other interlocking uh, type nail. So if you do regular you know, adult trauma, tibial or femoral nails, other lengthening nails, this is a technique we should all be um, pretty familiar with. And once we've placed it through, we tend to curl our ends on both sides and you wanna make sure that you're not tethering the physis. So on this one, these are coming in just below the physis and there's numerous other pictures to prove that. Um, what we will often do in, particularly in this case, is shoot the wire from medial to lateral. If you can see the wire in your incision, you can bend it and pull it back. Otherwise you can just um, come all the way through the skin, make a small incision, bend the wire, then pull your wire back and then be able to cut it short on the medial side and bend it so that you can leave it as low profile as possible. Um, that's in the femur, that was the technique we used where we went from medial to lateral, I had the wire go out the lateral side, bent it, made a small incision, pulled it back, and then same thing um, on the medial where we were able to make a small incision so that we could cut it short and then leave it uh, seated, seated low profile within the leg. So those are all the examples that I've got. Um, and let me stop sharing. And we can, I guess, address some questions or if Dr. Paley has any comments. No, let's open it up for questions. And uh, those are very nice cases. You see what I mean, that we mostly use it as a prophylactic rod. Uh, we use it as a temporary arthrodesis across joints. So like we'll do a, for example, we'll, we'll do a knee capsular release and instead of bracing from the outside, especially with some of these very short femurs, we will put in a rod that goes down the femur, through the knee joint and into the tibia and leave that in for six weeks and then pull it back, cut it off and leave it uh, buried in the distal epiphysis at six weeks. And so it stays there to protect, the, creating an epiphyseolysis of the distal femur with the aggressive therapy that we put these kids through. So it's just got so many uses, um, you know, and I think that even though we don't do a lot of fractures with it, uh, this is so much easier, I think, than using uh, a lot of these flexible nails. You don't have any of these issues of the sharp end sticking out, all this other stuff. You can leave these things in for a long time. I mean, the only issue would be if, if you are locking and you're crossing a growth plate, obviously you want to take your locking pin out if it's going to tether growth. These are not telescopic nails. 
Um, so I see a couple of questions asking about deep infections. Um, can, any concern about deep infection when we rod at the time of X-fix removal? So um, our protocol is um, that these patients end up, so they get um, usually vancomycin at the time of the frame removal, and then they go on antibiotics, uh, an oral regimen for two to three weeks afterwards in order to prevent deep infections. And, and that's based on, so we actually have a lot of data on that. So um, you can, uh, when, when someone's had a previous X-fix or, well, there's two aspects to this. One is somebody who's, you're literally taking off the X-fix. So a critical part of that removal is we debride all of the granulation tissue uh, from the soft tissues and from the bone. And it's, it's, it sounds easier than it actually is. To debris them, the best instrument is actually a four by four gauze, which you push in with a caret and you twirl it. And as it twirls it, it's incredibly abrasive and it rubs out all of the granulation tissue from the soft tissues. For the bone, of course, we just use a curette. A lot of the newer pins that are HA coated, we never find any loosening or granulation tissue in the bone. Um, when you do the nailing, if the pins are more anterior or posterior, I mean, sometimes I can direct my nail to be behind or in front of the pins again to minimize the risk of infection. Our risk is really small of infection. Um, at one point, we did a statistic, the risk was 4%, but the risk of fracture was 34%. So it was basically caught between two evils and we chose the 4% infection rate. Even since then, with the newer pins and everything we're doing, I don't even think we're hitting 1% deep infection with these slim rods. It's a whole different thing than when you're putting a, something like a precise nail in uh, after in a patient who's had a previous X-fix. That's a completely different risk. And there you've got L forms that are uh, sleeping in the bone and you can wake them up by the reaming. And that's where the, the um, because you've reamed the bone, that's where three, two to three weeks of antibiotics makes a big difference. And we actually have statistics on that showing that when we didn't do that, we had as much as 16, like when we put a precise nail in, a patient who may have had an X-fix 10 years earlier, we had as much as 16% in, uh, deep infection rate. While if we used the antibiotics, it went down to one or 2%. But the slim rods were less than 1%. Um, again, usually a two-week oral antibiotic prescription. And a lot of times since they've had, you know, uh, MRSA, uh, we're dealing with things like clindamycin or Bactrim in kids because we don't want to use uh, um, uh, Cipro in growing children. So we have a question here in the chat asking about what is the advantage compared to lateral entry nails and when is the bullet used? So I can just say for um, sizing wise, lateral entry nails on the market start at seven millimeters. Those are the smallest ones available. So just in terms of sizes, I think is, is one of the reasons to motivate a, a decision for a slim, but maybe you can uh, compliment on that. Well, the, you know, I think you mean, when you say lateral entry, you mean the trochanteric nails in the femur? Is that what the lateral entry is referring to? Yes. Okay, because in the tibia, it's not lateral entry. No, um, for femur. Okay. Yeah, so for the femur, look, this is, first of all, this is being used in children who are not candidates for the most part for a... Uh, even the smallest diameter of locking nails that are out there. Yeah. Um, so no question, look, you got a 10 year old kid with a good size diameter and you can put a seven or eight millimeter locking nail for a femur fracture. I would choose that, I wouldn't use this, okay? But there's a lot of children under that age where you can't get, um, you know, you can't get uh, a locking nail, you know, I think the smallest locking nails are seven or seven and a half millimeter. Some companies eight millimeters or eight five. So I, I think, you know, you really, and remember, you got to over ream. So you got to ream to uh, a millimeter and a half to two millimeters greater than that to get these nails in. 
So you're needing to ream to nine or 10 millimeters, okay? With this, you're reaming basically the size of the nail. I think it's 0.025 millimeters greater than the size of the nail. Um, most people don't know that the drill bits are actually calibrated to be a, a uh, what is it, a quarter of a millimeter bigger? Exactly, yeah. Right. So, um, and so, yeah, I mean, you can't put uh, locking nails in the type of bones that we just showed you. Um, so this is a great alternative. And it's really the ones that you're currently using these, you know, titanium elastic intramedullary um, nails. I think that group of fractures lends itself really well to this. Um, we're trying to show you kind of reconstructive applications for this nail. And there's so many cases, look, even when you take out hardware, how many times have you taken out hardware and gotten a fracture, okay? Or worried about getting a fracture. So, you know, in the femur, especially subtrochanteric area, we'll take out a plate and screw one of these things into the greater trochanter and we'll leave it there for a long time. And the child can start walking right away, never worry about breaking the bone and so on. Um, and that nail can be either left in or removed at a later date. So some of the very specific questions, uh, thank you, Claire, is she's, uh, are being answered uh, in the Q&A. Um, one uh, question I think I can apply to a lot of people is, do you think the slim and small two to four year old OI children uh, instead of FD? Um, and I think that it, for, for me at least, when people ask me what should we use, it, it goes back to what you were just mentioning in terms of size. A two or four year old's tibia can very rarely accommodate a 3-2 FD. Uh, so slim becomes a good placeholder uh, until the, the child grows for sufficient diameter. Well, I, I think the indication for FD is completely different. FD is the telescopic nail, which is designed for the growth. Is about young OI. Oh, three. young OI specifically, got it. Right. But yes. we put FD rods in sometimes, you know, 12 month old, like we can off, you can often fit them in quite small bones. Yeah. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're putting, you know, all our, all our congenital cirrhosis patients. So it's the smaller bones, the tibia, not the femur. I mean, we are putting 3.2 millimeter FD rods. That one case that Claire showed that very complicated S shaped tibia. And, and by the way, I want to, want to make one disclaimer. Um, all those cases with non-unions and complications. They didn't, yeah, they, we didn't make the non-union. They're all Claire's, no. <laughs> they came to us that way. <laughs> yeah, she just came from Hopkins, no, I'm just kidding. No, they actually all were referred cases. These are not done at our center. So I, um, and, and we get our own complications and we use slims in those too, but those were not. But the one case that, that she showed you with the S-shaped tibia, where there was a plate on the side and a slim rod going down, Normally in a CPT, we use a fascia duval. The reason we use that is the diameter was so small, it was a 2.6. The largest nail I could put in was the 2.6, okay? I couldn't even put a 3.2. And for that reason, there is no fascia duval small, currently smaller than uh, a 3.2. So to me, the really, really tiny bones you may be using one of these. You won't have the advantage of having a telescopic nail that's protecting all aspects of the bone. And you know, if that's important, like for OI or F or fibrous dysplasia or CPT, then you're gonna have to come back and change out that once you get some growth. And that's not an uncommon thing. We also have the reverse. Like our kids with CPT get rotted for the rest of their life, but some of them come back towards later teenage years, where they don't have much growth left, I'm not gonna change them out to another FD rod. They don't need the protection of their bone uh, that will telescope. So right. I remove the FD and I put a slim rod in instead, and that serves them for the rest of their lives, kind of like rebar, you know, uh, metal inside bone for the rest of their lives. So a question here, do you, do you note any episiodesis after rod removal? Thank you. So we've not had any, uh, but um, you know, we've done a lot of these um, 
contemporary arthrodesis of joints. That's our name for it. It's more of a billing code because um, when you cross a joint, you can actually bill it as a temporary arthrodesis of the joint, by the way, uh, if that helps anyone. But so we, we do, the, you know, I, I mentioned we do the knee contractures and uh, the knee is straightened by the, usually we're doing some shortening of the femur, soft tissue releases, including capsulotomy, uh, nerve decompressions. And some of these are really severe, like 90 degree contractures we're doing acutely. And what we will do is then put a rod all the way across femur to tibia. Now, um, when we change that rod out at six weeks, we're shortening it. So we use the same rod and put it back down. So it plugs the hole in the femur, but the tibia hole is left open. I've never seen a growth plate closure from that. Um, as Claire mentioned, as they grow off the femur rod, um, it's so slowly, I think that the growth plate actually seals the hole itself behind the nail. And we haven't seen any growth plate closures from that either. Also, just in terms of diameter, it's such a small diameter hole that the amount of growth plate surface area that you're damaging, there's numerous studies to show that that cross-sectional area is not enough to cause, in most cases, an actual growth arrest. You may get a temporary small bar that it breaks itself. There's some doubt. It, it might happen more if it was in... Um, you know, closer to the end of growth. But I think most of the kids we're using this in are, are really these very young kids who have incredibly fast growth at that age, which overpowers any tiny bridge that maybe occurs. Yeah. Uh, another question there, uh, since we mentioned the bullet, what would you see the indications of the bullets? When would you use it? I think primarily for uh, fractures. Fractures. And do you see... Um, uh, I mean, we could use it for lengthening, you know, when you remove it, if you, you, I mean, Claire showed a beautiful case, which despite, and this doesn't happen very often, <clears throat> despite prophylactically rotting it and so on, um, it collapsed the regenerate. Interestingly, by the way, Fatty, which proves how good the proximal, you know, corkscrew is, it didn't, you know, a rush rod, a rush rod would have just come out the top. Yeah. Which I guess is one advantage. Um, this thing was so well locked proximally, it went into the joint. Right. Yeah, so it, 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 it shows you that, in fact, that corkscrew works very well. Now, in a case like that, um, if we had, and that was too small a rod, I think it was a 3-2, it was too small a rod to lock with a pin, okay? Yeah, so, we set it up when we put the new one. Right, so when we put the new one, we had to ream up. Uh, I think it was actually a 4.0. We reamed up to a 4.8 in order to lock it, mm -hmm. which I didn't want to do the first time. I wanted to, <clears throat> you know, just put in uh, what was strong enough to resist the bending forces, but I really didn't think about the shortening was going to be a big factor. Yeah, that's, that's pretty uncommon when we put these in. That's the first time I've seen that in a long time. Uh, it's the first time I've seen it actually on a slim rod. I've seen it on a um, rush rod, but I haven't seen it on a slim rod. So uh, one other question that we have in the Q&A is uh, which, problem, which problems do you have when you change FD to slim in the, at the end of growth? Uh, FD and slim have different head profiles. So just on the, on the technical side, um, FD <laughs> and slim, as the implant gets bigger, so does the head. So the a head of a 3.2 th is smaller than the head of a 4.8 or of a 6.4. So if you're removing a 4.8 FD to put a permanent rebar functioning slim rod that's a 5.6 or a 6.4, that head has a bigger is bigger than the previous FD, so it will sit. If you're replacing with the same size, then you're relying on the cone shape and, and so on. Yeah, the, it, correct me if I'm wrong, Fatty. The slim... Uh, has the same head size from 4.8 onwards. It, are the head size of the three below 3.2 the same as above it or? From memory, 202632 have the same head, 4048 the same head, and 5664 the same head. Okay, so there is some incremental increase. Right. 
and they're very small increases. But uh, on top of that, you do have that proximal pinhole. Um, you know, that was developed in part for also um, fibrous dis dysplasia or whenever you're threading in and there's no purchase because of very poor bone quality, then a, a cross pin can be utilized just to create additional stability. So I, be I believe we've covered all the questions. Thank you all for numerous questions. Uh, I think the only other one I saw in the chat side was, do we see any, I think they mean, it says attention shielding, but I think they maybe mean stress shielding of the nails. Yeah, I'm not sure what that, that what they mean by that question. Attention shielding, yeah, I'm not sure. It's probably uh, used the wrong terminology, but it's hard to make sense of it. Um, yeah, these nails are so flexible. I don't think you get any shielding. You also don't get a stress riser effect. You know, if you have a big nail and it stops in the mid femur, right. create a big stress riser. I've never seen that with these nails. No, patients never complain of stress pain at the end of the, of the rod. Okay, that's good to know. Even, even if they've grown a certain amount and you're no longer very distal. Okay. Yeah. I think one thing to emphasize about this in terms of insertion, um, so this is very easy to bend. There is actually a bending tool, uh, which is a bunch of holes which you use to bend the rod with. And you always bend with the bevel. So you bend, you know, um, uh, so you're curving with the bevel. And when you do that, you can snake this down. That's one of the best aspects of this. And even better than you can do with a titanium um, flexible nail. You know, the titanium flexible nails, most of them have that J-shaped, um, yeah. blunt-tipped end. Well, that blunt tip doesn't make it very easy. It's supposed to be easier to bounce off a cortex. I can tell you, I can bounce off a cortex with this way easier. And I can add a bend to this. So, and adding the bend and the amount, the malleability of it, is definitely a function of stainless steel. And it's something you don't have as much in um, titanium. You just don't get the same level of malleability. It's more fragile. You know, I've never seen one of these, by the way, never seen one of these break, okay? I do have one that bent. It's really actually a remarkable picture. I mean, this girl was in a bent because her femur broke. She had limited knee motion, 45 degrees. She was running around a swimming pool. Bone was long healed and she landed badly. So her knee wanted to bend more than 45 degrees and it couldn't. So it managed to break the distal femur and bend the slim rod together. She had a little ouch and then nothing because she was fully stabilized. It was a buckle fracture with a rod already in place. And, you know, she was coming in for an elective leg lengthening. And I said to mom, we have a problem here. You got a 45 degree bend in the bone, you know, and the rod accommodated to that bend, but it didn't break. So I think, again, stainless steel is way more malleable, way more forgiving than titanium. I don't know why everybody's latched on to titanium. Uh, to me, it offers no advantages. It's more expensive and lighter, but we don't need lighter. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shannon, Dr. Paley, for this very informative webinar. And thank you everyone for attending. Excellent questions. Very much appreciated. All right. Thank you, guys.